should, should explain you why a hospital deals with uh, questions uh, regarding deep learning and uh, data mining. Um, I work for uh, the University Hospital of Zurich. Um, I'm the head of data management there. And um, around two years ago, we realized that we have a, a, a treasure uh, lying in, inside our um, our systems. Um, we were one of the first hospitals uh, in Europe, actually, who started with digitalization. And for many years now, we have complete uh, digital me medical records. And um, two years ago, we realized that um, uh, new technologies um, give us uh, possibilities uh, like to, to extract more information from the pretext uh, that lies inside our, um, our reports and in our uh, medical doc documentation. So um, we started looking for um, a partner because we knew that uh, we are not the experts on, on data mining, of course. Um, we know the medical stuff and uh, we know how to translate um, digi digital context and medical context into codes. But we needed uh, a partner that can uh, actually uh, do the job and, and develop a solution uh, to get more information out of our uh, data. And um, we found that uh, with um, DXC and um, kind of the, the head of the solution is uh, here with me today. That's uh, Prozenko Djordjevic. And um, we have an ATH student as well who works uh, with us on, on certain topics for the solution. And um, what's uh, the business context? Why do we, why do we need that? Um, the, what, what we try to extract from uh, the medical records right now is diagnosis codes. Um, there is an international classification of diseases um, that's actually vetted all over the world. And it's translated into different languages, so there is a German version as well. And uh, we need that um, for, for our billing. Um, we have around 40,000 um, uh, inpatient treatments every year, and every single case has to be coded. So a medical coder goes there, he reads everything, every report, everything that's written down by nurses or by doctors, and that can be hundreds of pages. And of course, that's error prone. Um, it's, it's very likely that um, a medical coder will miss something somewhere. It can be work, it can be a certain problem, or diagnosis, or whatever. Um, and how does it work? We, we have a patient that is treated, and um, after the patient leaves the, the hospital, um, all the information from the case is actually translated into a medical coding. Um, we take information such as uh, age, gender, and something as well, but that lies in, inside our systems. Um, the most intensive part, and, and that's what uh, actually causes most of the work as well, is uh, to translate the diagnosis and, and to find the right ones. And you need experts for that. They're pretty expensive. We have um, overall um, 13 people working just on that. Um, but they do nothing uh, else. They just read uh, medical records and, and translate codes. And uh, of course, that's a very repetitive work. Um, it's, it's more interesting if we can provide um, a basis um, that is often used or, or codes that are very often used and the medical coders just have to look for the, for the rare ones. So um, that's what we actually wanted to achieve. We wanted a solution that's able to, to do a semi-automatic coding and to find the right codes for, for most of the cases or let's say 80% of the cases. And uh, that was, was our original goal. And uh, what are the challenges? Um, we needed large amounts of data for that um, to train the systems. And uh, we extracted more than 200,000 patient cases and, and all the reports uh, that, that were um, adapted to it to train the system. And um, we are, we're dealing with more than 14,000 uh, diagnosis codes that exist. So it's, it's really a multi-class problem. And um, that makes it really challenging. Um, it has a great impact on, on our finances because the missing of one single code can mean that we get 40,000 Swiss francs less for that case in, 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 if it's a bad situation. Um, so we 
if it's only just one or two percent that we're missing, it means for us the loss of millions of Swiss francs every year. So the leverage is quite high, and, and that's why we we're looking for that as well. Although we know that, that there are many other uh, problems we could solve if we are um, that far, and, and if we get automatic diagnosis out of our pretests. So how we um, actually dealt with the problem and, and what we really did, um, I will leave that up to present to explain that. Um, I'll give you a quick introduction um, what happened at the very beginning. So UC approached us and uh, said, uh, listen guys, we have here a set of data. There's a lot of uh, information in it. Please do something in it to uh, to improve our medical coding process, uh, most of all to make it uh, more correct or more efficient. Uh, what we got was the caseload uh, 2012 to 2016, which is uh, all historical data, all labeled data, so all the uh, electronic health records uh, were previously been coded by um, the UC medical coders. Um, we, uh, this caseload contains about 200k uh, EHRs, electronic health records, after cleanup, um, removing orphans, NAs and stuff, uh, we ended up with about 187k um, health records. Uh, in other terms, uh, when summarizing the duration of stay of all the patients across these five years, uh, we calculated uh, 3,800 uh, years actually um, of one patient staying at the hospital. Uh, to give you a, a rough idea of, about the size of the problem we're dealing with, uh, the whole ICD-10 classification has about uh, 14k uh, classes, uh, which is quite big. Uh, UC treats uh, around 8,000 diseases, uh, so that's the classification UC is dealing with. Uh, for a, a so-called MVP, a minimal viable product, um, the benchmark is to come up with a model that performs well for about 2,000 uh, diseases. So that would, would make up a solution that you can uh, use in, in, a, in a daily business in a, in a hospital. Um, in average, each um, health record contains about eight diagnoses. That means we need for each health record to, to come up with a list of about eight uh, IC tankos, which makes this a multi-label classification problem. Uh, looking at the uh, corpus, uh, we have several types of text documents uh, in this big case load. We're talking diagnosis lists, uh, we're talking operation letters, we have discharge letters. And that is only a subset of the documents that is maintained at, at the hospital here. So we ended up with about 1 million uh, tax documents. Uh, digging a bit deeper, looking at uh, the text, um, we saw uh, quite a few challenges coming up when we were looking at the text. So uh, this is free text. This is um, an example that we copied from the original EHR. Uh, it contains uh, normal diagnosis, which are valid diagnosis, explaining what the patient had. Uh, then there are so-called uh, coding guidelines for a medical coder um, that he has to follow. Uh, like, for instance, how to document suspected diagnosis or how to document uh, past events like uh, anamnesis information, which is a diagnosis from, from uh, that the patient had in the past, basically. Uh, then uh, another big challenge is diagnoses that are excluded. So a physician wouldn't, he, he writes even what he doesn't see or what is not there. That means they're excluding diagnosis. So uh, there's different uh, aspects that we had to tackle. Uh, the biggest challenge was the excluded diagnosis because the physician could also write that we were able to exclude a hypertension. So a hypertension shouldn't be actually coded then by the system. In order to um, tackle these challenges, uh, we came up with the idea uh, to not only use text, but to also complement our models 
complement the NLP approach by using additional features like the ones that listed here, age, gender, so social demographics, um, but also so-called operations and procedures and medication. Um, we started out with a proof of concept. This is just very quickly a uh, proof of concept on R. Uh, we used the usual suspects like carrot, MLR, uh, ggplot. Um, we benchmarked uh, quite a lot of um, algorithms actually. Uh, random forest, random ferns uh, were the best ones performing, at least while using uh, relative uh, word frequency to encode the features. Um, once we reached the proof of concept, uh, it was clear at the very beginning that um, the solution will not scale on R, so we um, planned to port the solution uh, to Apache Spark, uh, which we achieved in January this year. Uh, we're running a standalone cluster. We ported the solution to Scala. Um, we're tackling the multi label uh, um, classification to problem transformation, meaning we're using uh, an OBR one versus REST. Um, we've been using TF, IDF, Amgram, switched then over to Word2x, so we have the usual suspects. In addition, um, a colleague from the ETH is currently running his master thesis and he's also uh, benchmarking uh, this on TensorFlow using Python and RMS. Regarding the results, um, we were pretty fast able to prove the concept that by adding uh, these non-text features, uh, the performance of our models were, were in, uh, enhanced, were improved a lot. Um, most of all, what we call the, uh, the heavyweight features are the so-called operations and procedures and education. Operations and procedures are very specific, very closely related with the, with the features. Um, this, these are the numbers of today. Um, the, the level, the, the label space that we reached, uh, the, that we reached only recently is um, Using the complete set of features is a label space of 1,024 classes, so we, we reached halfway. Uh, we're looking most of all in terms of performance at specificity and sensitivity. Specificity meaning uh, the capability of the model to uh, exclude a given disease. That means that the bigger you you grow your label space, uh, the more um, the, the more uh, you will get ISO 10 codes recommended by the machine. So the aim is for us, and most of all for the, for the hospital, is to reach a uh, specificity which is as high as possible. Otherwise, the coder will be flooded with, with a huge list of, of uh, diseases of ICP-10 codes. So we reach here uh, quite impressive results. Um, but to get an idea of what that means from a medical perspective, I'm going to move into that's one example of um, what you get as a result, and to be honest, we're really surprised by these results. Um, because uh, what, what we've coded is on the left-hand side, um, these uh, six codes over there, and uh, the machine uh, proposed much more. And um, as you can see here, the green ones um, are those um, that should have been coded and, and that have been missed by the medical coders. So there were um, missing codes that are supposed by the machine and, and that uh, we can take into account either uh, if we do a revision of, of uh, the paste of the past builds and um, then we can uh, charge it to the insurances and, and get the money back. Um, the red ones uh, are, are wrong suggestions. Um, these are the ones that have to be skipped by the medical coders and we really try to keep this list uh, as short as possible because it means <coughs> to check this every time and uh, that's why we need a very very high specificity and um, the, the results are really hilarious um, there are others um, that are yellow um, that are in a strong context and, and that are not really wrong but um, sometimes uh, the coding guidelines um, have restrictions and uh, tell you what to code and what not and, um, the machine will not be able to understand that uh, it's part of the medical coders to decide in these cases um, if, it, if they uh, take the codes uh, into account or if they skip them. But um, that's 
that's really um, promising and um, we've reached a stage where we can predict uh, like 70% of the codes uh, that have to be coded for the cases. So um, what, what, what do we do with that? Um, the next steps are in the short term that we um, want to uh, include more features like the lab results. We don't have them uh, inside the system uh, right now. And uh, we're um, checking uh, cases from the past and, and um, filling them uh, and, and um, getting more money out of it. So that's um, the, the financial part. But uh, if we look uh, in the midterm, we want to support our coders to make uh, their job more attractive. So we are embedding it into our um, clinical information system. And um, what, what I like the most is actually uh, we want to do something for our patients as well. And if we get um, diagnosis codes from uh, the pretexts um, from the beginning of, of the state, um, we can realize, well, that's a complicated constellation. And uh, if a patient has a high risk for complications or something, um, we can embed warnings for, for the doctors. So that's active or proactive uh, medical decision support. And that's the future. And we're getting really close to it right now um, to embed these into our systems. Because we have the infrastructure and we're getting the results. Um, that's that's our presentation so far. Any questions? So I guess that as far as I understand the process in the hospital, it's um, a historical reason that you first write a medical report and then in the coding. So were there any ideas to to um, the birth process and to the coding along with the, with the medical and pro, uh, medical report, or do even the coding first and then do an automatic medical report? Um, then we have to send our medical coders to the doctors. Uh, that's actually not what we want. And we want them to concentrate on uh, treating the patients. Uh, we, we want to keep that as far away from them as possible because uh, their job is not to code cases or, or to, to deal with uh, medical codes. Uh, their job is to, to treat our patients and to achieve good results there. Um, nevertheless, it, it can support them if we can um, integrate it into the system without realizing, uh, for them it's not important how it works actually. Um, but uh, if um, a doctor does a prescription of a certain medication, for instance, um, this machine could realize, well, there's an allergy that that medication should not be given, or the lab results do, do not uh, match, and uh, you should take something else. So we are getting that far, and um, we can prevent complications, and, and even uh, um, we, we could reduce our mortality rates by using something like that. That's uh, the dream we have, actually. Maybe just one more question. So so um, thanks very much for the talk. I think very interesting. Um, could you explain maybe a little bit more on on the feature engineering part, or is there is there anything going on on, on this side? Uh, more specifically, um, are you interested? Are you restricting the terms for working back based on frequency or any yes. other metric? Yes. Yes. Uh, regarding feature engineering, we we put a lot of uh, brains in, in this, so we we were moving from from. Of idea, so from, from relative uh, term frequency uh, to, to using anagrams to using word embeddings, and uh, the, um, we're, we're restricting vocabulary size, we're uh, restricting also uh, the, the frequency, uh, or depending uh, on the frequency of term, a given term uh, appears, it is considered as part of the vocabulary or not. So that's, that's where we are uh, tuning our But you don't have an apology. No, no, no. That, that, that was a very early idea using ontologies or even rule-based systems, but we wanted to not interfere at all with, 